everyone. Yes, I see some waves, nice. That means that you can probably hear me, that's great. Welcome everyone to our first ever online virtual meetup. So the circumstances that make us come here aren't that great, but we're super excited that at least all of you were able to join us tonight. And let's see if we can make this online event as much fun as we normally make the offline events. So we'll start with a small introduction by me. Um, I will introduce the Dutch NR user group uh, for the people who haven't been here before. And then I will hand it over to Frank, who will tell us something about Bluetooth. And then we will have a small break and we will have a second speaker, Eugene, telling us also a very interesting story about Gradle. So let's start with a small introduction about the Dutch Android user group. We were founded in 2011, and by now we have more than 1,200 members, which is awesome. We're purely focused on Android, and it's a free meetup. So we try to do a meetup every month. For now, those will be virtual. Um, and normally we meet up somewhere in the Netherlands. Um, we try to do it in a place where everyone can visit us. And these are the current organizers, Jazino, Rob, Dion, and me. And you can find us online on the meetup page on dutchauk.org, and you can go to Slack, uh, and you can join us in the Slack channel where we are chatting a lot about questions we have and about all kinds of things Android related. So we are the Dutch Android user group, and we are part actually of a, a bigger group so we have the Google Cloud group next to us, and we have the Women Tech Makers, and all of those are actually part of the big Google developer group of the Netherlands. And there's a lot of interesting meetups also organized by those other groups. And you can find all of them at gdgnl.app. So again, the speakers for today, Frank and Eugene, and I'm really, really excited that they wanted to join us today. Um, they were very flexible with moving from an offline to an online event and they, they tried it out with us and we're super excited that they're here today. The agenda, again, we will have the first talk with a Q&A. So if you have any questions during the talk, um, please hold them up a little bit. And at the end, Dion will help to basically make you, uh, give you the opportunity to ask questions. And he will actually then unmute you, so give you the opportunity to actually have a real conversation with the person given a talk. Um, in between the talks, we will have a small 10 minute break. Um, chat is opened, you can chat about the talk, you can chat about anything you want. And then we will have a second talk, again a Q&A, and we will be in the chat for a little bit more after the second talk to answer any questions you might have. So if you have any issues with like your audio, your setup or whatever, um, you can chat directly with the host. In this case, that is Dion or me. And that way we can help you out if there's anything that's going wrong. Um, when the Q&A is happening, uh, we will ask you to raise your hand if you have a question. And with raise your hand, I do not mean like raising your physical hand because we will not be able to see all of you raising your hand um, that easily. But there's actually a way in uh, Zoom to do this. So I will show you in a second. And at the moment you raise your hands, Dion will actually give you the mic basically and he will tell you that you can ask your question. So we hope that this goes super smoothly, but of course we haven't tried this before either. So we're gonna see how it goes. And bear with us a little bit, please. Um, so if you want to raise your hand, there is a link somewhere in your Zoom um, screen. There's this bar and it shows something like participants or manage participants or something, something of the like. Uh, and if you click that, you will see a list of the people in this meetup. And there should be a button somewhere that says raise hands. And just to check, I would like all of you to try it out now. And if at least like three of you manage to do it, then I will, yes, I see you, oh, four, five, six, yes. I like it. I see also a thumbs up, but we're gonna deal with a thumbs up as well. Cool. Okay, and Dion will actually put your hand down again if you're done, so that should be fine. Awesome, so I think we can start, yes. Um, I would like to ask uh, Frank to take it away. He can take over my screen and start with his presentation.
Now the big question is, can Frank take over my screen? Can you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. Okay, uh, first uh, let's talk about the company. Uh, this uh, meetup should have been hosted by uh, Flitsmeister in our office in Venendaal, but you know, Corona happened. So a little bit about Flitsmeister. Flitsmeister is an uh, app for, for people driving in a car. It's supposed to be a driver's best friend. So what does it do for you? It warns you about speed cameras, so you don't get fines for driving too fast. It warns you about traffic jams, incidents, uh, if they are working on the roads. Uh, they also um, show digital traffic signs, like the matrix border you see above the road. We also have navigation, emergency vehicle warnings. So if there's an ambulance, you get a message about 800 meters in advance. Uh, recently, we added smart traffic lights. Not only does the app show you the state of the traffic light at this moment, but it will also give you a little bit priority because the traffic light knows you are coming. And we also added parking. So you can pay for parking uh, in the Netherlands. For now, it's just uh, on-street parking, but later we will also include QPark. So here are some uh, screenshots, totally uh, stolen from the marketing team. Uh, we have some uh, uh, notifications on the most uh, leftmost screen that tell you about the state of the road. So there is a traffic jam, there's a stationary vehicle, there's a speed trap, all that kind of uh, stuff. So how about our community? Because uh, our traffic information comes from the community. We need all the people who are using the app to get this information. We now have 1.7 million active users. That's a 20% increase uh, from last year. And most users have 20 or more sessions per month. So they basically use it every working day. The average is 24 minutes per session. So they have a commute time of 24 minutes on average. We have uh, pro accounts. And if you pay for pro, then the app will no longer show advertisements. We have uh, 20 million reports reported by our users. And we also have a million validated reports. Now for the more interesting uh, statistics, 62% of our users are on iPhone, iOS, and 38% use Android. Could be a bit uh, higher if you ask me. 72% of our users are males and 28% are female users. We have 27 Flitzmeisters. That's the name for our uh, employees. So a little bit of history. In 2009, there was a bit of frustration. Our um, now founders, they got some, uh, some fines, cost a lot of money. So in 2010, they uh, published their first version and they got a lot of positive reviews. The app was not free. It was, uh, I think, about two euros on the Apple App Store. And uh, a year after, they made it a serious business. In 2012, they made the app free, which increased the number of users very, uh, very much. And in 2013, they partnered with the radio stations. So uh, as you might have known, almost every radio station, every commercial radio station in the Netherlands, has traffic information by Flitsmeister. The flitzers, the speed traps, the traffic jams, it's all through our community. In 2014, we only had a half a million users. That's 
not much compared to what we have today. In 2015, there was an investment by Mi Mobile. In 2016, we reached 1 million users. In 2017, we started with the project CITS, which is a, a project that spans multiple countries to increase our, um, our traffic information. In 2019, we are on every commercial radio station. And the most important for this talk, in December of last year, we launched the Flitzmeister One. It is a hardware device that you can put in your car and it will warn you for all these traffic alerts. Hope you can see this. Here's a picture of our team. I'm not on this picture because uh, this picture was taken before I joined. Okay, enough of that. Time for the real presentation. Let's see. How do I make this full screen again? There we go. Okay, so this talk is about the Flitzmeister One, the device, and the challenges we had with the Bluetooth low power. Okay, so first up, what is this device and what is it used for? It uh, has three main purposes. It warns you if there is uh, something uh, you need to be aware of, like a speed trap or a dangerous situation on the road, maybe an ambulance, it will beep and it has a flashing light. It also has buttons and you can press these buttons to um, say this uh, notification is correct or it's incorrect. Just press the blue button and then the rest of the community will know there is actually something here to be warned about. And the third main feature is it will help you to uh, start the app automatically. So you will never forget to start your Flitzmeister app on your phone again. The device uh, has Bluetooth. And if you come into the range of the device and the device is always in your car, then the app knows it's time to start Flitzmeister. So the device itself, it, this wasn't actually made by Flitzmeister. There were two choices. We could make a device uh, by ourselves, but it would take too much time. Or we could just buy a device that was available on the market. And we chose the latter because of timing. So this is what we got from uh, this device from Denmark. The device is called the Safe One. And as you can see, it looks kind of the same as the Flitzmeister One, except for the buttons. Instead of a camera, we have a little check mark. So we received a couple of the hardware devices. We received some documentation, as you can see on the right, some source code, which didn't compile. It was just, they stripped a package from their own app and that's what we got. Didn't compile at all. But luckily we found in the source code, we saw a hint to Nordic semiconductors. They use a library for Bluetooth low power from Nordic semiconductors. It's a support library, just like the support libraries of Android we're used to, but instead uh, made by Nordic semiconductors. So if they have a library, they must have a sample app, a demonstration app. And they did. So I uh, downloaded the app called NRF Connect, which helps you with testing Bluetooth low energy devices. Through this app, I found out that uh, Bluetooth low energy devices, they have uh, a certain order. You have the GET server, it has services, and the services, they have characteristics. 
and these characteristics can have descriptors. So there's this neat uh, way of ordering and combining and grouping things together that uh, belong together. Now, what can we do? We can write bytes to these characteristics to make the device do things. For example, we can blink the LED on the device or we can make a sound. And we can also read characteristics to get information from the device. For example, which button has been pressed on the device or uh, maybe the motion state because the device also includes a motion sensor. Here is a little uh, movie to demonstrate. I'm using the app NRF Connect to send some bytes over to the device. Well, it's a little bit short video, but you can see the LED blinks because of uh, the bytes that have been sent. Okay, great, it works on the demo. Now to make it work from our own app. So I started working with the first part, which was scanning. You have to scan for the device. So we make a callback. And uh, if there is a scan result, we try to connect to this device and we connect to the GATT. For now, this is, uh, this is fine. But later on, we discovered this is not fine if you are working with you know, multiple people because this setup will just connect to the first device it will find. If there are multiple of these devices lying around at the office, you don't know which one it's connected to. <laughs> but for now, this is fine. We have a connection. We can send some bytes. So, if we have a connection, we have another callback. And this is the other callback. It will uh, send you uh, a message if the connection state has changed. You have to listen uh, for this. If the device is connected, then you can send calls to the device. You, uh, there is also a possibility that you get a callback that the connection state is disconnected. Sometimes, it doesn't really work. It doesn't want to connect and you have to retry. And after a couple of times, if it still doesn't work, you might have to reboot your Bluetooth stack. Just turn Bluetooth off, turn it back on again, then it will work. But let's say the connection state is connected. We are connected. We can uh, send messages to the device. The first thing you have to do is call discover services. Because as you saw in the slide little bit back, there are these services and these have to be discovered. Okay, when that's done, you come into the second callback, which is on services discovered. And now we can actually send some bytes to the device. So we take our get object, we get the services, we find the service with the UUID that matches the service that uh, we want to address. We get the characteristic from the service. We give it a value, in this case, an array of bytes. We write it and it works. This is uh, exactly the same as what I did in the video a couple slides back. Just a quick reminder, it blinks the LED, the LED, but now from our own application. So this works, this is great, this was easy. Uh, everything by the documentation, no problem at all. This is gonna be a breeze. Well, not anymore. Second step was to find out which button has been pressed. In the demo app, it's very easy. You press a button and it will tell you what the device sees. 
it will give you one byte and the first few uh, the first four bits will tell you the state like pressed released or hold held and the last four bytes they will give you which button has been pressed four zeros for the blue button three zeros and one for the red button looks easy enough Here's a piece of the documentation that uh, explains this. So with this documentation, I've created the following piece of code. We take our Bluetooth callback and we uh, listen to the uncharacteristic changed because um, we're not polling, we're just waiting for the button to be pressed. We're waiting for a notification. When uh, this characteristic has changed, we just receive the byte. We get, uh, we check out the last four bits to find out which button is pressed. And we want to find out what event happened. And um, we ask the Bluetooth God to report this, to notify us. So we get the surface, we get the characteristic, and we set characteristic notifications to true. But the thing is, it does, this doesn't work. I thought it was going to be easy. No, this is not easy. Nothing happens. The callback is never called. What am I missing? So we go back to the demonstration app. So what is different between the demonstration app and the code that I just made. Well, the difference is on the left screenshot, you see nothing special. On the right screenshot is where the notifications are enabled. The difference is they actually changed the descriptor of the characteristic. And the descriptor has to say notifications enabled. Okay, fair enough, sure. Every UUID and every service of uh, every service and every every characteristic, they have a UUID. The descriptor also has a UUID. But here's a problem: this UUID is too short. It's only four characters. The other UUIDs are way longer. If I try to put this in my code, this will result in a compiling error. Luckily, I found there is a base UUID, which you can use to get the full UUID. So we take this uh, template, we add those four characters from before to the UUID, and then we get the resulting UUID for this descriptor. So the code is uh, basically the same as before, except we now also set the value for the descriptor. You might think we're done. No, still doesn't work. And that's because we need a queue. The thing is, uh, the call set characteristic notifications does a write operation to the device. The write descriptor call also does a write operation to the device but they're not queued by Android. So the latter overrides the first one. And uh, both writes have to be done to uh, get this notification thing working. So we go back to our friend from before, the callback, and we see there is a callback for on characteristic write. So we wait until this callback has been called, and then we do the second write call. After creating a queue, all was fine, it worked. And uh, the iOS team was laughing their ass off because the core Bluetooth library in uh, iOS already includes a queue. We, on Android, we get a little bit more low level access to the Bluetooth hardware, but in exchange, we also have to write our own stuff like a queue, which maybe should have been in the library. 
So time for the next challenge. It's about also a head scratcher. The documentation said the following about the battery life. It's an unsigned 16-bit value representing the battery voltage in millivolt. Okay, sounds uh, easy enough. Picture on the right is uh, the actual battery that's included in the device. It's a three volt battery. But the value I received from the device was 44043. If you calculate that back to volts, that would mean 44 volts. That's way more than the battery can deliver. What's wrong? I send an email to the, the, to the company SAFE to ask for clarification. Is your documentation wrong? Am I doing something wrong? And they answered the following. The value returned in the battery voltage characteristic is little endian. I heard of this before, but I didn't really know what it meant. Apparently, it means that if you receive multiple bytes, the byte order is in reverse order. So if I reversed the same bytes as before, and I put them in the correct order, the value reads 2988, also known as 2.9 volts. And this is a way more accurate result. This battery was almost completely full, and it will last for about two years. Then we had the last uh, major thing we wanted to include in our application, and it was the uh, automatic connect. The application, it needed to be uh, started automatically. For Android, we already had something like this. We uh, used Google activ activity recognition to find out if you are in a car. We also uh, have uh, a separate Bluetooth listener. If your phone connects to your car Bluetooth, it will automatically start the app. No problem. But that wasn't the case on iOS. The iPhone team, they couldn't make this work. They couldn't just listen to a specific Bluetooth and then start the app. There was no such feature in iOS. So they really wanted to include this in this device. And this is why they chose uh, specifically a Bluetooth low power device, because that also includes the iBeacon. So you can ask the iPhone OS to listen for a specific beacon, and in response to this iBeacon, start a specific app. In this case, if it finds our Flitzmeister iBeacon, start the Flitzmeister app. We thought, you know, this iBeacon, we can receive that on Android. We can use the same thing. And we tried. But we found out that the iBeacon is only transmitted once every two minutes. That's not quick enough. We don't want the people to be driving already for two minutes. And then the app starts. The app has to start as soon as possible, immediately at best. And we didn't actually want uh, our application to be running the whole time. It has to be started by the OS. Android didn't really provide a feature in this, but Google did. Uh, Google has a service called Google Nearby, and you can give the service a specific iBeacon to listen to or any Bluetooth advertisement, because an iBeacon is just a Bluetooth advertisement. The thing is, Google nearby scans maybe once every 10 minutes. The iBeacon only transmits about once every two minutes. And the specific scan by Google nearby only takes maybe half a minute. The math just didn't add up. There was a very large chance that the scanning from Google nearby would never find this iBeacon. So we scrapped that idea. We were just scanning for the Bluetooth advertisement of the device itself. 
and that Bluetooth advertisement is broadcasted about once every second. This was quick enough, but it meant that our application had to be running the whole time. We can't just uh, give this Bluetooth advertisement to Google nearby and wait for our app to be started. It would take 10 minutes. Background scanning, yeah, but if you use background scanning, your app might be garbage collected. So after much debate, we said, you know what? The only way to do this is with a foreground notification. So if you have a Flitsmeister One device connected to your phone, there will always be this permanent notification to keep the Flitsmeister app running in a background state to scan for you this Bluetooth advertisement. So it's now non-stop scanning with a foreground notification. Next thing, what uh, we found out was the range of this Bluetooth device is actually quite large. And if you look at this uh, image on the right, the cars are parked right next to their office. If the Flitsmeister One device is in your car, you are still connected from behind your desk. This was a problem. We didn't want, you know, Flitsmeister to start every time you walk, uh, you walk by your car. So we tried a couple uh, ways to limit this. First one, we looked at the uh, transmission power. This is uh, measured in decibels. And I think the range is uh, from zero, which means the perfect connection until like minus 90 decibels. And this is barely noticeable, like the, the end of the spectrum. And we chose for 67. If the, uh, the Bluetooth signal strength is better than 67 decibels, then we connect to the device. We connect, we start, uh, we stop the scanning, and then we wait. We won't start the app at this moment, because that would still mean that if you walk next to your car, Flitsmeister app will start. We use the motion sensor in the device. So we connect to the device and we just wait as long as it takes. As long as the motion sensor says there is no motion, the app won't start. But as soon as the app, uh, the device does see motion, that's the moment when we start Flitsmeister. And this is actually uh, pretty funny to see. As soon as you, uh, you sit in your car and you sit down with a, you know, a plof, plof that's when the app starts. <laughs> and sometimes it's a bit slow. It starts when you start your engine. Vroom. And this solved uh, a lot of problems for us at the office as well, because uh, not only the Android team was working on this device, but also the iPhone team. So next up, we had a lot, a lot, a whole lot of connection problems. I think that uh, the people who also tried this uh, Bluetooth low power you all know this, uh, this is just the biggest problem. Sometimes it connects 10 times in a row without a problem. The other day, it doesn't want to connect at all. You reboot your phone five times and suddenly it works again. No idea why. And it also has a different behavior on different devices. So for example, this Google Pixel device here, this was terrible. I think maybe 50% of the times it connected. On the other hand, this Samsung Galaxy Note 8, it connects about 90% of the times without a problem. This is so hard to reproduce. And if you get it to reproduce, then yeah, good luck with finding out why. The Bluetooth stack just gives you a generic error code and there's basically nothing you can do. 
uh, Stack Overflow says that there is some corruption in your Bluetooth stack and there is no way for you to fix this. The only way to fix this is by turning Bluetooth off, turning Bluetooth on again and hope that it's fixed. And if it doesn't, try to reboot the phone. So we had to, uh, we received a lot of feedback from users that the connection problems, they were just terrible. So we had to uh, implement some fixes just to make it bearable. The first thing we tried was setting our own connection timeout because the, the operating system doesn't do this uh, automatically. So we call this uh, connect God function and we just wait for the callback and the callback never came. So we said, you know what, um, let's give it five seconds. And if it doesn't connect in five seconds, we just assume the callback will never come. And then we retry. We uh, retry connecting five times. And if it's not connected after five retries, we just reboot the Bluetooth stack. So that's why we use the Bluetooth administration permission. We just turn off your Bluetooth and turn it back on again. And we specifically do this ourselves and we don't ask this from the user because the user will get annoyed if they have to do this multiple times in a row. Another thing, and this is borderline voodoo programming for those who know the term, do we stop the scanner before connecting or after connecting? So for some context, uh, you scan for these uh, Bluetooth devices and you get a list of results. And you take this result and you connect to this specific result. But do you have to stop the scanner? Or do you have to keep the scanner running while connecting to this scan result? And the results were mixed. Some devices apparently worked better before stopping the scanner and some after and some didn't really matter. Like the Samsung Galaxy Note 8, uh, just connect it, doesn't matter. And there was also a specific flag called auto connect. The documentation from Android wasn't really clear what this meant. Um, documentation could be interpreted as we want to connect when the device is ready for a connection instead of right now. So we first uh, tried setting this auto connect to false, as in we don't want to wait till the device is ready, we want to connect right now. Some devices it worked, some devices it didn't. And uh, just after a couple of weeks, we finally found out what the auto connect flag actually does. It tries to automatically reconnect. And that's actually a thing that we wanted. So in the end, we put this flag uh, auto connect to true and hope for the best. It uh, worked on most devices. Now, a different uh, problem, a different challenge we faced was what do we do when we find multiple devices? which was especially annoying at the office when you know, the Android team and the iPhone team are working on the same function at the same time. So we implemented the screen you see on the right, which shows there are multiple Flitzmeister One devices found. And how do we differentiate between the two? You just have to move the Flitzmeister One device closer to the phone, and we can tell by the connection strength. The one with the highest connection strength that's the device you want to connect to. Didn't work flawless, but worked well enough for most cases. And this uh, connection strength is called the RSSI. Uh, in the left screenshot, you can see the notification that is always shown, by the way. We also uh, changed the icon to show what state we are in, because uh, a lot of users, they they wanted to know what's happening. So when the device is connected, this notification actually um, changes its text from scanning to standby. 
and when it's in standby, it's just waiting for motion. As soon as the device detects motion, that's when Flitzmeister will start. So after lots and lots of uh, trying and trying on many different devices and getting lots and lots of somewhat angry feedback from our users, we uh, ironed out a lot and lots of connection problems. And I really hope that you won't have to deal with all these connection problems. And uh, that's my journey through uh, the Bluetooth Low Energy. I hope you find it interesting and I'm uh, open for questions. Thank you, Frank. Can you, can you hear me? Double check. Do no you questions? I don't think we can hear you. Um, but in the meantime, I see, is that Johan, is that a hand or is that just you clapping? Hmm, interesting. I think I will see it as a hand and I can unmute you, Johan. Oh, you're just clapping, okay. Uh, Ivano has a question. Yes, okay, there we go. Ivano, go ahead, ask your question. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Joan. Uh, well, I'm really curious about the testing of this uh, kind of uh, product. I mean, uh, I think in the specific use cases, uh, you don't transmit sensitive data. But I'm wondering in, uh, how do you test uh, these kind of uh, features? And also, if you do specific uh, penetration testing uh, for Bluetooth or something like that. Okay, so uh, that's actually a very uh, interesting question because uh, this device supports uh, encryption and uh, the hardware is there, but we don't use it. The original device made by SAFE from Denmark actually does use this uh, feature. So the connection between your phone and this device isn't encrypted like with normal uh, Bluetooth devices. And that has to do with pairing. Uh, when a Bluetooth device pairs with a, a different Bluetooth device, they share a common key, just like uh, you know with Wi-Fi, and that's used for the encryption. Bluetooth low power doesn't pair with your phone. So every time you want to connect, you basically have to scan and pair again. But you can uh, encrypt the data you send over. And uh, the way they did this with uh, the original device, the when you uh, connect to the device, it will only accept uh, a write to one specific characteristic. And that uh, characteristic, you have to write a specific password. And when that password is uh, incorrect, it will just disconnect your connection. But if the password is correct, then you can uh, write, of, uh, you can read from a different characteristic and there's the encryption key. And from that moment on, you just encrypt your data, your bytes through this uh, shared encryption key. Thanks. And uh, the other question, uh, how would you test this? Uh, we use this, uh, the app called NRF Connect, and you can just sign, uh, send bytes, just raw bytes to the device, and then you can uh, test the functions. Any other questions? I think uh, Hugo might have something interesting to add, so I will unmute him for a second and he can go ahead and give us some nice, interesting additions. Okay, yeah, um, so <laughs> this stuff has got li uh, gotten a little bit, be a bit better, I think, but uh, uh, since I, I worked with this like in 2015 or something, and some something like the auto connect has gotten a little bit better. Usually, you auto connect uh, after the connection fails, but it's still a little bit wonky. Uh, but the, the tip that uh, you didn't mention, I think, but it's kind of important that if you handle these callbacks, um, it's generally a good idea to move off that 
thread where it's being called because it's being called from a binder thread. And if you block that thread for too long, for by accident or whatever, then you basically kill the whole Bluetooth stack. So um, that's one of my uh, my tips here. If you have the threading and the queuing right, then it generally works. Um, uh, I, I build a little thing for myself, and uh, I don't see a lot of connection issues, but that's just maybe I'm lucky. But generally, if you follow these rules, like the, the threading and the queuing, then you should be um, pretty pretty good. Though, um, yeah, it's still tricky, like you like you mentioned. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely uh, correct. Uh, the queue was absolutely essential and the uh, threading also really helped. Didn't solve every connection problem, but it certainly helped a lot. Yeah. Well, Fab, uh, we have another question. Sorry, I'm going in Dutch. <laughs> we have a question from Wim Verhoef. Go right ahead. You're unmuted now. Thank you. Um, have you considered uh, using a library instead of, let's say, some 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 abstraction library instead of doing everything uh, low level yourself? Uh, well, we actually do use a library. We use the support library from uh, Nordic Semiconductors, mm -hmm. and it's basically the same as the support libraries. It makes sure that you don't have to write different code for different Android versions. Okay. But, uh, the question is uh, very valid. Why didn't we use like uh, a more elaborate uh, library instead of making all this low-level stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, the main reason was uh, that uh, we wanted to uh, incorporate as much source code from uh, SAF, the, the, the company from Denmark, as we could. And they used this uh, library for Nordic Semiconductors. So in the end, we didn't copy and paste any code, <laughs> but the, we wanted to. Yeah, I, I know there are some libraries which uh, do the abstraction uh, and the queuing and all, all that kind of stuff. I don't know the name right now out of the top of my head. And also I know it's not free. So that could be another reason not to use these libraries, but I know you're up, uh, you're up for a big job if you want to do it all yourself. Yes. Uh, I actually found out about this uh, paid library. Mm -hmm. Also forgot the name. Maybe Sweet Blue or something. Something uh, like that, yeah. Uh, and the the timing wasn't right. When I found out about this library, we you were already, already were. almost at our deadline because mm -hmm. we wanted to get these devices out before Christmas because of marketing reasons. So it was a very tight uh, uh, deadline. And uh, we didn't want to waste any time by switching to a different uh, library. I fully and understand. Uh, spend money. La last question. Can you give some kind of idea of the coverage of all the devices which are now used? Uh, how many problems do you have on Android uh, with, with Bluetooth? Um, I don't have the uh, current numbers, but I think our Flurry Analytics said that 20% um, of all users of the device had connection problems. 20% had problems, okay. Yeah. And I think that was after we made some fixes. Before we made fixes, it was uh, even higher. And do you see it back in the reviews? Uh, in the beginning, absolutely. And we also saw it in our support inbox. Mm -hmm. But uh, things has, uh, have settled down. Uh, we have made enough fixes to make the connection work well enough. And I don't think it, uh, it affects uh, the score anymore. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... I think we're done with the questions. Uh, we will have 10 minutes during the break in which you can, of course, continue in the chat. I see a lot of interesting comments there of other people who have used um, different Bluetooth libraries. So let's definitely continue this conversation. Go to the toilet, go get something to drink, and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Frank. No problem.
Test, test. Works. Okay, so uh, we two minutes late. Uh, I don't want to keep everyone uh, still awake. Oh, sorry. I still want to keep everyone still awake. <laughs> so, uh, super nice evening. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, uh, honored to have uh, to be the first speaker on the first uh, uh, online uh, meeting. And uh, Oh uh, yeah, and um, for people who don't know me, I'm uh, Eugen. So my name is Eugen. I'm originally from Ukraine, but living now uh, nine years uh, in Netherlands. I I uh, Android engineer, and um, I'll talk today about grid a little bit. And let's uh, start <coughs> sharing the screen. And uh, let me know if you see it well a uh, um, can i move this yes. okay now you probably see a wrong screen yeah <laughs> Then I have to do uh, it with the big screen, and it means um, you will see me, my face, uh, right face. Okay, let me do the new share, and then let me do this guy, and let me play my presentation. Oops, oops, oops. One more time, the last Zoom thing. Should be okay. Let me know if it works for you as well. And uh, it works. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, do it fast. So, as you can imagine, I'm going to talk about Gradle uh, again, and um, uh, I put incremental in the brackets, so it will be mostly about uh, incremental, but this these changes or this. Uh, uh, um, um, methods or these uh, techniques will help you also with not incremental build. And uh, a short agenda for today uh, that, um, okay, let me, can I move this stuff again? The zoom is everywhere, so. Uh, okay, so short agenda for today, I'll talk really quick about what uh, uh, what is incremental builds, uh, why we care about them. So I'll talk about, uh, uh, first attempt of uh, making builds faster is modularization and i'll talk about dependencies dependencies and dependencies uh thank you steve balmer 
And then uh, I'll talk about another technique, uh, how to make a uh, build faster, uh, no matter incremental or uh, clean builds is tag reflect. Uh, and I was planning also talk about motion reflect, uh, but unfortunately, uh, I will not know about talk about the motion reflect. I had a technical problem there. I tried to solve it. I stuck. Uh, so it makes my presentation shorter, which is nice. And then we will have a short or not short, whatever uh, Q&A session. So let's go. And uh, um, incremental builds. Uh, so what are incremental builds? So you know that majority of our time we're working on the dev machines, we are dealing with uh, incremental builds. So uh, incremental build is build which is happening after some successful or partially successful build with some uh, uh, a small or not small changes already done on the code base. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's what we do every day uh, and majority of time of the day, unless you check out new branch or you do clean uh, build. And of course, um, the small times for these incremental builds is better. So we are focused, we are not distracted, uh, we are more productive. And of course, uh, ideally we expect that our incremental builds are for the small change are a matter of seconds. And of course, uh, it's never the case with Gradle, uh, especially with uh, multimodal projects. Uh, so, but uh, that's life. And uh, a first approach and the most important or the most used approach actually to uh, tackle build speed uh, and the incremental build speeds is a modularization, especially incremental build speeds. Uh, and means uh, modularization means like you will build, break your app on smaller modules, uh, preferably on really small modules. And uh, uh, it means uh, Gradle will use uh, power of your course and uh, will parallelize as much as possible stuff. It will of course help with uh, clean builds as well. Uh, but uh, modularization means also that uh, if you do the changes, they probably affect just small amount of the modules and then Gradle smart enough to actually only rebuild these modules and modules which are dependent on these modules. Uh, so the build will be faster. And uh, when, you when you break up in dependencies, in module dependencies, uh, of course, you'll have like a graph of your project. And of course, you also have uh, uh, external dependencies. And uh, the build speed may vary a lot uh, uh, depending on your graph of, of your project. So uh, it's really important to take care and the group uh, graph your project. And uh, of course, the main focus for us uh, is uh, uh, dependencies for your modules because they are subjects of, uh, of incremental builds of changing uh, on the machine. And uh, they will influence the incremental builds and uh, what Gradle will rebuild, what not. But also external dependencies, uh, I think it's also important to have them clean. Uh, they will bring you, um, if you have unused dependencies, then we'll bloat your app with software, obviously with the, with the code. Uh, of course, maybe use uh, some uh, optimizer on the release and you don't have this problem on the release, but still you have majority of the time you spend with debug. As well, resource processing, um, uh, manifest merging, and uh, whatever, whatever, GT fire, everything will hit these uh, external dependencies. Uh, it's not a big, but uh, it's nice that my must, uh, my last, uh, well, the last item is my favorite. So it's nice to have everything clean and the control. I'm a bit control freak, and uh, that's uh, a way I how to, I'll try to deal with these things. So, um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that I'll mention a lot of uh, Gradle plugins today, and uh, this is a bit of old school uh, talk. Um, uh, it's my my philosophy uh, five years ago, uh, when everything should be done through the Gradle uh, because it's cross platform. It's uh, it's one language that we understand. It's a build tool that we use. Uh, and uh, of course there are plugins which we can reuse. Uh, so it's a bit of nostalgia right now, of course uh, it's changed, uh, but I'll talk to you about uh, a lot of different plugins and it's not, to, it's not like you have to use these plugins, but it's more about like uh, to uh, awake the thought uh, and rethink in your head, in your team maybe and uh, maybe use these dependencies, especially if you have a small uh, company or you're just indie developer, or just you solo developer, I think it's perfectly fine to use um, uh, uh, some Gradle modules or Gradle plugins for small projects. And uh, the first one uh, is a dependency analysis plugin. So 
and uh, it came uh, around a couple of months ago, uh, but it's already shining and it's already like a spot on my eye. And what it pro what it actually promise you, it will actually report you on used dependencies that can be removed. It will also uh, report you uh, about wrong configurations. So you might misuse API with implementation. Uh, it will talk, oh, it will, sorry, it will uh, t uh, say you about uh, transitive dependencies that you are actually, that you should declare directly. So this cleanest. Uh, and then of course there are last point which we will not talk focus today. And, um, oops, oops, too much. And the uh, philosophy of this plugin, uh, uh, actually two things. First, you should directly uh, declare every dependency you use. So uh, it means every time when you are um, and you factor and you change your product structure, you remove dependency on some module and then suddenly it stopped compiling because there was some transitive dependencies that you used. So no more uh, unhidden dependencies. Uh, so when you read build gradle file, you see what exactly you use in this module. Uh, so it's clean. Uh, secondly, uh, the second point, the second uh, uh, philosophy point is uh, you should really, uh, uh, you should correctly declare a dependency as implementation API depending is it really implementation detail or part of ABI. And ABI is a binary API. And I saw, and actually it's the old week, I think we used a couple of times the API. So I was before thinking clear, uh, like how say, uh, simply thinking API is just implementation extra level that if you declare some dependency by API, it doesn't mean that, it means not only your model depends on that has has dependency on that uh, on that uh, dependency, but also every sub project which is dependent on your model will also have this dependency. But actually, uh, there is a uh, term ABI binary API, and um, here's an example like here. So we have my class which implements my other class, and my class is defined model A, and my other class is defined model B. Then A should declare a B as API dependency because my other is a part of the the binary API. So uh, I think it's one of the important points of this presentation. So uh, uh, don't misuse uh, uh, API uh, configuration like extra dependency or extra level dependency, but uh, think about this one and uh, this plugin will help you with that. And uh, of course it's new plugin, so uh, it has some limitations. There are one, uh, uh, um, official uh, limitation, uh, it will give you a false positive if you are using resource. So basically, if your model use resource from the model, uh, model A use resource from model B, then you will get false positive that you can remove model B dependency, but it's not. Uh, uh, think about this or I mean, keep, keep this in mind. Um, then it will give you also false positive for the module or dependencies uh, that are not present by, so you not use consume source code uh, uh, from the model, but for example, uh, you are have depend, you have additional functionality by manifest merging, like leak canary or crash logics. So basically there is uh, this hidden content, uh, um, uh, there's hidden functionality which is uh, added by manifest merging a uh, provider will start, will initiate the libraries, you will get this uh, stuff initiated automatically. So this model, this, this plugin will say you uh, you can remove this dependency, but it's not. And I also tried it with a dynamic feature and uh, my first attempt was actually trying to support it with dynamic features. And it was a bit uh, chaotic. So I was trying to clean up dependencies one module. I spent half an hour, hour trying to actually remove one, try to compile, something to compile and so on and so on. And apparently, uh, yeah, I didn't work much with dynamic features. So apparently there is like a, a rule that uh, uh, you, if your two dynamic features want to use same dependency, you will not actually declare dependency in this dynamic feature, but you need to move it uh, down to some common uh, module. And explanation is that uh, because this they are dynamically loaded, and if they provide different, if they use different versions of this uh, of this uh, dependency, you might have duplicated class on class on class pass, uh, uh, or it's even if you have same dependency. So it's uh, you will get a compiler, you will have build error, and it will say you that you need to move these dependencies down. But okay, so we will not focus about dynamic features now. But uh, I choose an open source project, which uh, f uh, uh, which is a, a pet project from one of the Googlers, Chris Bans. Uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly. 
and uh, doesn't matter what this app does but what's most important this app is multimodal is uh, and uh, it's perfect uh, perfect project to try this plugin on so uh, first there for today uh, I'm going to uh, um, go to my idea since I'm on the new screen I need to fire it here and I'm going to start uh, presentation mode and uh, uh, so you can see that this is uh, the, the module um, let me also also fire a terminal and hopefully terminal is big enough that you see my font um, back to the studio so uh, we have a multi-model project so there is around like um, I think 25 up to 30 percent of uh, sorry 30 modules in this app. Um, so I try to incorporate this plugin. So what you have to do first, you actually need to declare uh, plugin. So dependency analysis version 25 0 25 fine, uh, and then that's it. So the next actually change it's already was clean up of the uh, app module. So I used extensions not used. I removed uh, uh, I removed the uh, lifecycle extensions they're not used I removed navigation UI and Kanban sorry a bunch of other uh, dependencies uh, fine uh, I want to show you actually a real uh, uh, example here so I'm right now in the repository of this uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, of this project and I need just to run this uh, um, uh task which is build health this guy will actually run through all your dependencies it will build uh, uh graphs a bit and it will compile if uh, it, it needs some source uh, it needs bytecode to analyze actually binary api uh should be quite quick because i did it already so 14 seconds and most important it generates some uh advice uh, pretty json and we're going to look into this advice pretty json so it is in the build folder in your uh, in the uh, in the root project. So there is dependency analysis and uh, advice uh, pretty. There is actually advice pretty JSON, and there is actually misuse dependency JSON. And uh, before I was looking only to misuse dependencies, and uh, let's look into, for example, uh, tracked us. Uh, it's one of the modules in this project and um, yeah I want to actually uh, let's see for this module what the plugin suggests so uh, what does it say is that I have an uh, dependency data and uh, uh, it's the, it's actually implement uh, it's actually used as implementation dependency uh, but it can be removed so uh, basically uh, uh, when you see, um, oh yeah, this is mis this misuse dependency. So here's always a misuse dependencies. There, whatever you see here, this dependency can be removed. And uh, let's go uh, to the plugin. Oh, sorry, to module. I probably I'm trying to speak quick, so I might talk some, uh, say some nonsense. But uh, not, I mean, can we use terms like plugin and module? But please, uh, um, uh, excuse me. So. Uh, again, so we can remove data. Bam, uh, data. Where's data? These guys can be gone. Bam. Uh, what else? Uh, data is done. Uh, then we have also a browser. Oh yeah, we have a browser dependency. We can also remove it. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, browser is this guy. Uh, let's remove it. Uh, what else is there? uh and that's it so there's only two misuse dependencies and uh i'm going just to here and i'm going to prove uh that um it's still buildable uh and uh, i'm not i'm like i knew i i did it a couple of times before so i know it's actually uh buildable um but this is my routine when i'm cleaning up the module so i'm looking to do um okay so it's done i can even do like uh clean assemble debug but it will take time it will take up to one minute 30 seconds so this is my routine i'm going to uh, run the the 
report, I'm looking to what is misused, and then I'm uh, cleaning up dependencies which I reported, then I try to build. If no compile, build errors, fine, commit. If there are build comp uh, and some uh, kind of false positive or I misuse something or I made a mistake, come back and do the string and, uh, uh, and do it next. Okay, so it's, uh, it's uh, also 26 seconds, 26 seconds because I probably will also build it locally. And uh, let me run one more time the build health because I also want to show you an, another a report. So right now I use misuse dependencies and now I'll show you an advice dependencies and it's more interesting. Uh, so advice pretty is actually for the same module. Oh, like we see like a, a, a base now. Uh, oh yeah, so there are no data anymore. So before, if I would run it before, there will be also data here, which will be advisable to remove. There are no any more data uh, depends here. Uh, so it says I use a base uh, module and it suggests me to change it from implementation to API. API. So probably one of the classes, this module actually uh, extending or using the API from the module. So it's suggesting me to change it from implementation to API. Uh, I'm not going to do it now, but uh, uh, here it says I uh, also base Android used, uh, base Android uh, uh, module is implementation, but should be in API. Uh, then it says, uh, um, then it says uh, Dagger is also used in this module but it says only two configuration and doesn't say uh, any from uh, from configuration and it is because there uh, is no uh, dagger dependency here only cupped compiler uh, but uh, apparently we should use it as api dependency so uh, so we shouldn't add extra line to this module to actually uh, say we use dagger and it should be api dependency and then uh, looks like this is also module uh, track java so some external dependency and it's also some transitive dependency, and we have to also declare it as implementation. So no more surprises if we uh, we will know that we use this uh, uh, unhiddenly. And then uh, same stuff about inject. And finally, Kotlin uh, uh, std lib uh, also looks like a transitive dependency, um, and um, also looks like coroutines is also transitive dependency and should be declared as API. So. A bit chaotic, but basically uh, I should add a bunch of extra lines in this uh, Gradle file to uh, make uh, my uh, dependencies direct and uh, with proper scope, uh, with proper configuration. Okay, so come back to the presentation. Uh, can I play it? Demo one is over. Oh, sorry for sound effects. So uh, this is a TV application. Um, um, you see these modules, you see dependencies, so uh, extra lines, uh, a lot of lines. So you can imagine that it's only 25, 28 modules and it's already so complex. Uh, you can imagine what happens with the project, which is 100 modules or even more. And um, let's say we run this report already and we clean up dependencies, we declare them uh, properly. Uh, we removed uh, unused dependencies uh, and we kind of, uh, we are happy, but now we're thinking about like uh, how to keep this clean uh, further. So how to not to trap the situation. So what should I do? And uh, there's actually a nice plugin as well, which called uh, Graph Assert Plugin. And um, it's a bit basic, but it gives you an idea about what they can do. Uh, so it might, uh, it will assert you about uh, dependent configuration and it will assert you about uh, depths of your model graph. It will also assert your uh, correct dependencies order and extra functionality. It will generate this picture that you saw before, uh, but it's not topic of this. And uh, uh, this is an example of, uh, of the configuration. So you uh, have, um, or you can specify max height uh, the next one is most important is module layers. So here you define the layering of your of your uh, modules. So you say kind of you structure your project in a feature lib library libraries and core. And here you say that features might depend on libraries and libraries might depend on core, but core cannot depend on libraries and li uh, libraries cannot depend on features. And most strictly features cannot depend on the features and libraries cannot depend on the libraries. 
Uh, and this quite simplistic approach, because I know that even in district layers, in a more um, complex project, you will have sub layers where you have some common code between libraries and some common probably between core uh, and probably some common code between features. So um, you need to think about it uh, more uh, how to layer stuff. But I'm, I, I have like a gut feeling that um, you can do it. So. Uh, with some approach uh, and a naming convention, you can actually make it clear uh, the flow of your dependency of your uh, modules. And with this module, you, with uh, this graph, uh, sorry, this, this greater plugin, you can actually enforce it. So of course, you might have this exclude rule. So if you have some some legacy or some exclusion, some uh, uh, exemption from your examples, uh, you can uh, put them here. And the final is restricted, so you. Uh, even if you're, uh, if, if there are, you can actually restrict modules uh, yeah, even above your model layer of a map. So you can say, no way feature can depend on some forbidden feature. And yeah, it's nice to have this feature, but I was not able to find that, so, uh, how to say, example, a real example for this one. But let's do a demo. Uh, one more demo. And uh, I'm going back to Android Studio not in the studio, but in PLG, and I'm going to switch my branch. And I'm going to guard dependencies, yes. And uh, let's see what I have. Uh, this one, so uh, this is how you um, include this. Uh, so you just define this, uh, 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 you define this plugin. And uh, the last one, you actually, uh, you, uh, yeah, I declared uh, uh, configuration, so I said, oh yeah, let's uh, let's talk why I choose this configuration. So, um, um, so what I see here, uh, there are some actually structuring. So I see uh, some base, I see app, of course, I see some common modules, I see some UI modules. Uh, I see some presenter, so I assume that probably UI might depend on some presentation uh, layer, and then probably presentation will depend on a common layer. Uh, and uh, there are also this domain and data and the base, which gives me a sign this is core of the application. So I think, uh, so I structured it like this. So I was thinking like, okay, so UI uh, is probably dependent on presentation, then uh, common layer is another means. Then we have something like, and the base has just, here's a date and the base Android. So I, I structured like this. Then we have some special model like trucks house. I, I was thinking it's probably extra layer on the core. And the core for me is a base and data and domain and, uh, and something more. And let's see uh, what happens uh, with this configuration. So right now, if I'll try to, of course, first I'll try to clear. If I'll try now to uh, use uh, this task, it will assert something. And uh, okay, of course we need to configure a project and it failed and says exactly that my, I, I was expect, oh wait, actually why I was expecting four? Because here I already de declared one, two, three, four, five, at least six layers. So at least should be six, uh, max h6, but as we can already saw here, it's even 11. So the longest pass in my in my tree of dependencies is 11. And if you try to read it, like it's UI show details, UI episode details, UI episode details compose, compose, uh, then something image library loading, then something UI view, then something common resources, then something. Ta -da 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 -da. So you can imagine like how quite complex this pass and you can imagine uh, and let's let's actually do it a bit differently so let's actually say okay let's say 11 so i know now 11 i'm not going to fix it now immediately uh, so let's leave with it and let's see what's actually more this uh, plugin will report to me and then you can see that even with my rules i was wrong or i mean i mean like uh, the, the the flow between uh, dependencies is quite complex so for example the data actually depends on the base and data it depends on tract, and tract depends on the base, and then common some common UI view depends on some common, so it might be guessable, probably guessable, and then common epoxy depends on common UI view, it's not guessable at all for me, 
but still, so you can imagine that any newcomers who come into your project will be probably overwhelmed. Like, okay, what's your dependencies? How your graph of your project looks like? And it's really uh, good to think upfront about layering, about your modules. And this plugin uh, might help you to actually streamline and force uh, to keep it clean. So that's it for this uh, demo. Let's come back to uh, presentation. Demo two is over. And the last plugin in this section of modularization and dependencies is uh, Can I Drop the Jetifier? And it's also a plugin uh, for the Gradle. And uh, we moved to Android, so it was announced uh, as probably like two years ago. So, and um, maybe even more, I don't remember, but at least two years. And uh, I think a lot of our dependencies already moved to Android X. And you know this GT5 is quite heavy. Of course, it runs only once, then it's cached, but still, like uh, this extra lines, extra log, and other stuff is quite annoying. And um, let's say how we can check is do we need still GT5? So there is a plugin for this one. Uh, it has own configuration, so you can see, like, okay, you can declare if it's verbose or not. Should it include modules on the report about this uh, specific module? Uh, should it also analyze only Android and, and so on and so on. Uh, most important, there's a parallel mode, which is experimental. It didn't work for me. Uh, so if you will try this plugin and you don't see a report or the report says, well, fine, give it a try to run it in not parallel mode. It will be slower, uh, but you will definitely get the proper report. And with this, we are going to demo three. And with this, we are going again to Android Studio, and then we're going to go into change branch. And then we're going to drop GT fire. So yes, I know, I know, check out. And uh, let's see what I have here. So uh, this is, um, uh, so I def define the plugin, it's 0 0.5 version, fine. Uh, then uh, let's see the final version of the, of the configuration. I actually drop all this stuff and I just kept the both through. And let's see what it will say about uh, TV. So is it actually uh, ready? Uh, so let me clear again. Oops, uh, yes, please. And let's do uh the final i think is uh, this one so basically we stop uh, uh gt fire and then we run the plugin task and let's see uh, what it does for us some configuration as usual and now it runs and -da! so what we see actually we cannot drop gt fire yet uh, but uh, it's a bad sign or is it like, okay, so it's like not what we expected for, but if we try to uh, analyze it, we will see that usually this is, or this library, uh, open ID up house, or is this library, which is created by many people. Uh, and I know that in Robolitic there is already, or PR, or at least a ticket, which uh, talks about uh, uh, moving to Android X. And I don't know about this library, so I didn't check it, but I'm pretty sure, I don't know if it's open source, but if, if it's open source, it's quite easy to migrate it to Android X, uh, do it a couple of times and do the pull request, and then you might have this uh, done faster. So uh, that's end of the demo three. Let's come back to presentation. So, now we come into uh, reflection, and now we come into another beast uh, or another way of um, lowering the build speed for you. And uh, yeah, so five years ago, as I said, it's kind of uh, old school, not old school, like nostalgic talk. Five years ago, maybe six years ago, we, all, we were so excited about uh, code generation, no boilerplate, uh, no boilerplate writing code for us, everything will be generated, uh, life is heaven. And uh, three years after, especially with modularization, with, with Kotlin, KPT, and uh, it was not incremental. Uh, this was run always. It was uh, completely built for you. Every time when you do even smaller change, finally KPT or 
uh, annotation processing starting to be incremental, uh, but still uh, it's not performing well. There is a lot of cache stuff. And uh, finally, uh, someone gave, uh, I think it was Jake by itself, he gave like a crazy idea, like why not to use sometimes reflection instead of code generation? And then he said, Bum, let's actually, Dagger is quite an uh, interesting idea to do it actually through the reflection. And then he actually, probably all weekend or maybe a little faster, uh, he made a uh, Dagger reflect. And uh, this reflection based implementation of Dagger dependency library. And it has two ways of integration. I'll talk about this later. And uh, it has some limitations of choosing of implementation details. So uh, it's implemented through uh, Java API uh, uh, proxy and uh, that's only works with interfaces. So no abstract class for you. Uh, it also means uh, Kotlin, uh, some Kotlin issues. So if you have like or Java 8 issues when uh, you use interface with default, interface with uh, default methods, it will also translate to abstract classes, will not work for you. Uh, and it's also required to make your component all uh, public. So it might sucks uh, if you have like some hidden component in your module, uh, you, don't want to, you don't want to expose it, then you cannot use Dagger Reflect. So it's straight off. And finally, it doesn't support uh, Dagger producers. And I'll not talk about what is Dagger producers right now. Uh, if you are interested, we'll ask a question later. And then, 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 then um, two ways of integration of Dagger Reflect uh, is a partial and full. And the partial, there will still a small bit of uh, code generation, but uh, it's, a, it's actually, uh, it's a minus. So there is still code generation, which we want to completely remove but it's quite small, uh, but the plus is big plus that you don't need to modify your production code. You don't need to modify, modify your code when you're switching between uh, reflection and code generation. There is also full part of integration, which requires you to write a bridge uh, to, to, to have this difference of implementations. Uh, and you need to be smart about like, if you, for example, want to enable a, reflect, a reflection on debug and the code generation in, in production, you need to be smart how to organize this code to these bridges. Uh, or not have these bridges uh, and but it, the, the plus of this there are no code generation at all so you flee from code generation if it's your goal and I'm not going to do this by hand so there is actually section and Dagger reflect how you need to modify your build gradle how you need to do the smart things about if it's a debug uh, a build variant or it's a production a release uh, but there is actually a plugin for gradle as well again uh, called elect from Sunplant and this will do it for you automatically. So it's actually uh, use partial target reflect integration. Uh, and then um, it's actually uh, on the fly will change dependencies uh, for, for debug or for release build. So you make sure you need to make sure that you use a, a component builder or component factory for components. So because uh, the uh, for example, build method will not be generated for your component, so it should be done through the builders, through, through the builder. Then, uh, Dagger Reflect, the small part of Dagger Reflect code generation will actually uh, use it. And then you have to set runtime policy for your um, for your annotations, uh, custom annotations for qualifiers and map key. And you will see this in a demo, uh, uh, just uh, straightforward. So uh, demo number four. Let's go to Android Studio. Um, uh, let me close this. I need to. Uh, I need to go to recent and uh, project chosen for uh, for for the demo is actually played. Well-known uh, project from a uh, Googler uh, for Googlers as well used for many uh, cases to show some some techniques. Uh, and um, I choose it to show you uh, what to do. So let's see, uh, my first change was actually to introduce delect. Uh, so here's a deployed delect plugin. Uh, of course, not nice, nice to have the versions and so on. And also in previous demos, I didn't really pay attention to beauty of uh, Gradle, cleanness of Gradle files, uh, just to make it fast. But again, of course, uh, on where you need to follow what uh, um, conventions are in this uh, uh, used by, by the team. So you declare it and you apply the plugin. Uh, then I found that uh, 
there was already a builder, but someone just forgot to annotate it. So that was fixed from, by me. Uh, let, I probably do it too quick. Uh, sorry for that. If you, uh, yeah. So I'll come back. So I have to add the annotation back to, to the builder, forgotten. Then I need to change uh, a retention policy. So I need to change from binary to runtime. Otherwise it was crashing up in runtime because there was two dependencies, uh, same type uh, provided and uh, Dagger was not able to choose between uh, both of them. So this helped. Uh, then I had to actually, as I suggested, uh, to add builders to a couple of components. So one of component uh, here and uh, here. So I did two simple builders and it was green already. Uh, everything was compiled, it was crashing just in, in the middle time. And uh, the problem was uh, I filed the bug on Dagger Reflect. Uh, they decided to have some uh, a nice code. So they actually have base component, uh, some generic uh, interface where a messed inject is declared. And they have another interface, base activity component, which uh, uh, limit T to activity only. And then basically all other components in the, in the feature modules uh, they will just have a base component here and then you don't need to inject, you don't need to declare function inject. Uh, uh, but Dagger Reflect actually uh, have a bug, has a bug. So in runtime, when it's trying to resolve type of uh, object to, uh, which you need to be injected to, uh, to go over the uh, members, it's actually resolved not to the Helm activity, uh, but it's not resolved to, parent, uh, to parameter type uh, in the parent uh, class, which is object and uh, it doesn't insert anything and then of course it's new or uh, not uh, non-initiated uh, non fields uh, which crash in runtime so i have to remove that one and just have uh, uh had to declare this inject modules uh, in every component and then uh, let me show you uh, it builds so let me clear what was the last one here? No, no, I don't want, of course, to do here. So I want to actually run uh, green overview. And I want also just um, app um, install debug. And uh, you see it's saying uh, using uh, Dagger Reflect. So it's using Dagger Reflect. Of course, it's already built a couple of times. So it's in a cache and it's just five seconds build for me. And um, you don't see my emulator. I probably you see it now. And here's a plate and it starts and it loads something. And then I can just um, go through app. Yes, I load some articles. I can scroll, I can open still browser there was somewhere in different activity it's still browser but basically it works so it works fine good a nice uh, dagger reflect tools to to run uh for this app i actually didn't notice much of uh, of uh, slowness of start time time so activity was almost immediate shown on the screen uh for you old when we tried to use uh, dagger reflect uh, there was noticeable uh, delay between uh, activity start because we do injection on the ui thread uh, uh, but it's a debug build, so we were fine with it. So uh, that would be my demo for, and that's the last demo of today. Um, most important, what I want to show you, um, I hope it's visible. Uh, probably, um, hopefully you can read this text. Let me even like uh, um, go to, where where are you no no okay let, let's go come back to the presentation uh, i hope you, you you can see it so uh the text let me zoom a bit i know it doesn't work well so basically on top you see a run of uh dagger code generation and on the bottom you see run of uh of the build on uh, of code uh, of the uh, um, dagger reflection most important that you see some durations are different. So tasks are sweep, uh, swapped uh, in different order and uh, because it's all sorted by duration, uh, but also you see that the timing of durations are smaller. Uh, and most important on the right side with really small text, it says that 
uh, there was 12 tasks executed for uh, in, two, in, two, in two cases and uh, for code generation uh, in in total it took it would took one minute 70 seconds to run uh, cup tasks and on the bottom it's only 30, 40, 40 seconds to run uh, cup kpt tasks and it's also affected in the total build time so you see that uh, the build took one minute 31 seconds on top and one minute on uh, three seconds on the bottom and of course i would not trust these numbers and uh, um, uh, fully and it's one run and so on and so on uh, but I think that the gap is quite big uh, to have quite a trustful uh, conclusion that uh, Dagger uh, reflection is uh, yeah, making the build faster and it was clean build and you can imagine that uh, your incremental rebuilds will be also faster so, so Moshe reflection uh, Moshe reflection failed for me uh, um, yeah, I was. It was half an hour, maybe less, to actually integrate uh, motion reflection in the project. Unfortunately, when I ran it on the device, I got some reflection crash, and uh, it took me a day trying to not okay, not a day going back and forth, of course, but uh, in in a day I was trying to find out a solution. Uh, I didn't, so that's why I stripped this from my talk. Uh, but I want to actually say uh, the project which where where I tried to use uh, motion reflect and. Um, uh, it's one of the projects which I really recommend to go to deep and see uh, what it does. Uh, you know, when you join some a new team or uh, uh, you start a new com uh, a new project, it's always interesting to see like what approach is there, what kind of philosophy they follow, how they keep the grade of files, uh, and uh, how they do the care dependencies, what kind of uh, things they do for development, uh, for the extra development features. And so and so on. So it's a really nice project just to dip in, uh, to dive in. It's not easy project, so it will take time to understand some things. Uh, but we recommend to look into. Uh, there are just a couple of similar projects uh, online, like uh, Jquart and the U2020 app. Uh, so really interesting to look. Uh, uh, please check. And. Um, last not not least, so majority of knowledge that I talked today and. Uh, uh, majority of the information and the knowledge and the, and the, and the expression I took from uh, I took from my past employment from Yolt, and Yolt is hiring right now. So if you are interested, you are uh, looking forward, you are just curious, check uh, Yolt as a next employer. I uh, really recommend the team and the product. And that would be it so it's a question and answers please give, ask me some questions and i'll hope i'll give you some answers thank you so much Eugen. thank you um do we have any questions in the room it's almost nine o'clock so we have time for maybe one or a maximum two questions and if you have a question please put it in the channel in the, in the chat channel or raise your hands Yes, Hans, did I see you raise your hand or did you now quickly lower it again? <laughs> I have one question. One question. Yes. So, echo. so I was wondering why it's a bad thing to pull in um, transitive dependencies. Why would you need to declare them like explicitly? Yeah, okay, so uh, uh, clear. So. Uh, let's imagine a situation you are in heavy refactoring and then you decide uh, you move some class in different modules say I don't need this module anymore bam you remove this dependency to this module and bam it doesn't compile and it doesn't compile and then you scratch your head what did I do so what kind of dependency do I need of course it might be obvious from the from the build might be not so you need to go to a module which you just removed find the dependencies and find out what kind of dependencies should be used in your module so that's that's the answer Right, so it's mostly for when you accidentally using those transitive dependencies, I guess. Yeah, also, I mean, like, uh, you saw, uh, yeah, true also, and also it's clean, so you open the build grade file, you understand what it does use. Uh, so even without going to the source for, uh, to the source of the module, you, you understand maybe what it does. Uh, of course, some dependencies like uh, SDD library for the Kotlin, probably might be overkill, but you also can move it uh, to some common grade of file and just apply it and uh, will save you some lines as well. 
Okay, makes sense. Thank you very much. Let's let's keep the rest of the questions in the chat so we can round off now. I want to thank both of our speakers a lot. I know now that I should keep far, far away from Bluetooth low energy and that for great old, there's a lot I can do and I'm super afraid to actually run all those tools, but it's really, really helpful. So thank you a lot. Um, we don't have a bottle of wine to give you right now because we're this far away. But as a big thank you, we would like to give our both speakers a gift card for the Google Play Store so they can spend their evenings um, watching movies or reading books or playing games instead. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you so much. Um, we hope to get your feedback. You can find both of us in the Slack channel or you can find us in any other way. We're on Twitter, we're on GitHub, we're on Medium. You can find us wherever you want. Um, thank you very much for tonight. We hope to hear from you and we would like to see you again next month. Stay tuned.